welcome to the Fit and Healthy Show. Today our subject matter is going to be on liver health. Now we previously addressed hepatitis B, C, D, E, F, and so on and so forth. But today I really want to talk about um, things that cause problems with liver health, things that we can do to keep the liver healthy, and things we can do to reverse the issues or things that we've done to our liver. When we're talking about the liver, it performs over 500 different functions. 500 different functions. So, very complex organ, necessary for life. Without the liver, you're gone, you're done. So, there are three basic, basic functions of the liver, and this is as basic as I can give it, because it's actually quite complex. Um, major blood reservoir filters over a liter of blood a minute. A liter is a little bit uh, bigger than a quart. Uh, so removing bacteria, uh, toxins, pesticides, chemicals, uh, and antigens, which are um, uh, certain microbials or um, hormonal types of, uh, of um, components, Secret secretory. Uh, synthesis and secretion of bile. Now bile, the liver produces and then it's excreted into the gallbladder for storage. It produces about, once again, a little bit of over a quart a day. The bile is necessary for detoxification of the liver as well as keeping cholesterol regulated and stabilized for digesting your food and eliminates the toxins out of the liver that the liver neutralized. You know how that blood feeds all those toxins? That well, the blood is fed through the liver, that uh, liter uh, every minute. All those toxins have to be removed from the liver somehow, and so that bile removes it or takes it out, stores in the gallbladder, and then when digestion occurs, stimulates the gallbladder to produce it, and then boom, it goes out through the digestive tract. Um, metabolic. Um, the liver is responsible for carbohydrate, fat, and protein synthesis. So there's not too many <laughs> other foods Hmm. that we can think about other than carbs, fats, and proteins that we eat. So the liver is responsible for digestion in so many different ways. It also is responsible for the storage of fat-soluble vitamins and certain minerals. Uh, we mentioned how via the liver the bile is uh, excreted to the gallbladder and it excretes toxins. Also, in addition, the hormones that the body produce get filtered through the liver and the excessive amount that we don't utilize they go into the bile and they're excreted, particularly um, what we call oestrogens, which we see a lot in uh, pesticide chemicals and birth control pills. Synthetic types of estrogen forms, very, very important. So if you don't have proper bile excretion or liver function, you can't get rid of all those excessive amounts of hormones in the body, which can affect your mood, affect your sleep. We'll talk about some of the symptoms that are associated with having problems uh, with liver health. Uh, causes of impaired liver function. Okay, what we call number one would be probably is called a sluggish liver or cholestasis caused by gallstones um, and gallbladder removal. Oftentimes you'll get gallstones or people get gallstones and the first thing they do is remove the gallbladder which is one of the most unnecessary surgeries around. There are remedies that have been around for get this, over a hundred years that break down gallstones that apparently modern science chooses not to utilize, that will break them down within about 48 hours. And it's a combination of using some apple juice, magnesium, and some olive oil for about two days, and it breaks them down. You can go online and look up various formulas, but it'll, they'll excrete right out through the bowel. Um, they break down. They don't clog bile ducts. That's what we want, because the concern is if it, you get the gallstones in there, the clog a bile duct, then you're going to require emergency surgery, because it could be life-threatening. Um, alcohol is the most common cause of impaired liver, without any doubt, alcohol. <sighs> the reason why is alcohol <laughs> kind of almost pretty much shuts the liver and its ability to process fats, sugars, it pretty much impairs the liver completely. Very minor issues. That's why when you overdrink, you feel so sick, or drinkers or alcoholics will have yellow skin, jaundice, dark circles, their liver enzymes go crazy and wacko. Um, all active alcoholics have what is called a fatty liver. No exception. 
If a person's an, an, an alcoholic, they have a fatty liver. The liver is not going to perform those functions that we talked about if the liver is fatty to any type of degree. So increasing of liver cancers, phenomenal in alcoholics. And then, of course, we've got other issues with blood sugar metabolism. The list goes on and on. So if you are an alcoholic or choose to drink excessive amount of alcohols, not if you will have liver health problems, no question. So keep that in mind, particularly if you're younger or if you're older and you drink a lot of alcohol, that's a big no-no as far as your liver health is concerned. The occasional glass of wine, resveratrol, other things that are in there, you're fine. But if you're doing daily alcohol to any extreme, your liver is cooked. So bottom line, I say, I say it like it is. Um, Endotoxins, particularly chemicals and pesticides in excessive amounts. In this country, we allow over 3,000 different types of chemicals to be added to our foods. In Europe, you can't exceed 50. There's 50 that they allow added to foods. So our chemical industry uh, is allowed to meet bare requirements and then people in their products and then people eat tons of these. The liver's got to do the best it can to make these inert and remove them out of the body, but it really overworks the liver very, very much so, and then as we grow older and the liver function isn't as good, then it causes issues as far as li uh, mutation of liver cells, all kinds of things leading to liver, well, initially liver enzyme issues and then liver cancer. So um, pregnancy uh, or hormonal changes, um, you know, oftentimes pregnant women will get the liver spots on their face because we've got a lot of hormonal changes going on. But people who take a lot of steroidals, birth control pills for lengthy periods of time, particularly high dosages, are going to have some issues with their liver eventually because it's excessive amounts that the body cannot use and it's difficult to dispose of them. And after a long period of time of the liver becoming so stressed, it takes its toll. Medications, particularly painkillers. Um, you can look on your medications that you're taking. Uh, most of them, except for the newer medications, will give a list of whether or not it causes problem with the liver. And they usually use a, a fancy word called hepatic, which is H-E-P-A-T-I-C. And it's pronounced a couple of different ways. But what that means is liver enzyme functions, liver functions. Um, and so if you're on any medications that are hard on your liver, I would stomp my feet, scream and cry, and make sure that my doctor, particularly if I'm Lipitor, Zocor, pain medications, you need to make sure that you have those proper full panel uh, liver uh, function tests. Hyperthyroidism or the thyroid medications can cause issues um, with uh, the liver as well and its inability to detox and perform its functions. And then, of course, the separate subject that we've discussed before, hepatitis, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, as the list goes onward. The viral, if the body's having to deal with the viruses all the time, obviously it's not going to lend itself to handling all of these other functions that it has to perform. Moving on here, I'd like to discuss a little bit about the diagnosis. Now, we talked about the particular types of laboratory uh, tests that uh, physicians can perform, including serum bile. Oftentimes I don't see serum bile testing going on, and that's probably one of the first indicators of having issues with, uh, with, with the uh, gallbladder as well as the liver. In addition, the AST, the, uh, there's other tests, and we can, I can give all the abbreviations all day long, but the key is we want full panel testing, including serum bile uh, testing. Biopsy, if it looks as though these are staying extremely abnormal or a potential for liver cancer, particularly if we have uh, alcoholism, ongoing fatty liver, the enzymes are going out of control and they're not being able to be brought back into control, then a biopsy, obviously, for potential liver cancer is something that could be considered. Symptoms including, and this, is, this covers a lot of categories, so, but this is the most common ones that we see. Besides seeing liver spots, dark circles, and yellowing around the eyes, which I see probably in about a quarter of my customers that walk in the door, um, because they all seem to have very taxed liver. Stress also taxes the liver as well, too. Include fatigue, just general not feeling good, digestive problems, allergies, chemically sensitive to everything. That can be caused by a lot of other things as well. 
PMS, constipation, the hormones are all over the place. You're just not doing well. But the outside symptoms, like I said, liver spots, dark circles, and yellowing, and then jaundice if it gets to an extreme point. Diet is paramount when you're talking about the liver. Diet is paramount when we talk about just about everything. But the diet is getting good, wholesome fruits and vegetables organic. Because remember I told you how we have to process all those chemicals? Even if you just call them unsprayed, we don't even go organic. Keeping the chemicals down eases up on the liver. Eating a diet rich in water-soluble fibers, since this promotes bile excretion. Some of us, my husband, he's fantastic. Fiber, 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 and he's 100% right. Those fibers really, really help promote bile excretion. And most Americans do not have adequate amounts of fiber in their diet. So 25 to 30 grams of fiber, if you're eating your 8 to 10 servings of vegetables a day, you're great, you're in good shape. I know very few people that do that. So adding additional amounts of water-soluble fiber, psyllium husk, uh, apple pectins, grapefruit pectins, all those types of water-soluble fibers. Wheat fiber is not a soluble fiber. That's a bulking fiber. So if your doctor goes to tell you to eat more wheat bran, that ain't going to cut it. Your fruits and vegetables and then those other things I mentioned are water-soluble types of fibers that help, help tremendously liver health. Lots of greens as well as good fats. The greens oxygenate the blood. They help you detox on a cellular level. Um, foods are great, spirulina, coriella, all those types of superfood greens, seaweeds, whatever your particular cultural um, is based upon. I know a lot of the oriental diets have a lot of seaweeds and greens, wonderful for detoxification on the liver. And then those good fats reduce the inflammation down, and they also thin mucus out of the liver. So if you don't have adequate amounts of good fats and adequate amounts of water, particularly your mucus out of your liver, out of your congestion in your chest, your sinuses, whatever it be, is going to get very thick and sludgy, and you're not going to be able to move the bile out of the gallbladder, you're not going to be able to have, you're going to have bowel issues, you're going to have lots of things. But the liver, the body requires at least eight glasses of water a day, you know, distributed throughout the day, not all at once, obviously, but a glass every two, three hours, yeah, that's the way to go. There's a lot of supplements. The ones I chose to list on here are the ones that I know have studies or are very well time tested. So if your doctor says there's no evidence to support these items, he or she is wrong. Some of these have studies that are 200 years old. So they're wrong because there's studies to back every single one of these and a lot of them are fairly recent studies, both American universities studied, European, Japanese, Chinese studies that are good valid studies. Number one, keeping those good fats in the diet. We mentioned that earlier. But if you don't like nuts, walnuts, almonds, pecans, avocados, add the flax oil, add a clean fish oil. And I'm not talking about going down to the local grocery store and picking up the fish oil. We want a clean fish oil that's free of mer mercury, PCPs, and other chemical additives. Because then, once again, the liver's going to have to process all these chemical additives. Uh, yeah, no. So we want molecularly distilled, clean fish oils, Norwegian fish oils, good quality, mercury PCP free. Choline methionine combinations, what we call lipotropics. Huh. We find not so much a reversal, like particularly for alcoholism, but a prevention of damage that alcohol can cause to the liver. Particularly methionine, choline helps methionine work well. Uh, it's an amino acid. Uh, treats sluggish liver for some of those excessive estrogens as well as for alcohol. It also is very helpful. There's a, a syndrome called Gilbert syndrome, which is due to heredity that it can help alleviate as well. You'll say, it'll say on their lipotropics, but you can buy these things individually as well. Very well studied, L-carnitine, also commonly called carnitine. 500 milligrams two to three times a day on an empty stomach. Carnitine's needed um, because it handles increased fatty, as I mentioned on here, fatty acid load produced by alcohol in particular. So, or high fat diets or chemicals or sugars, it just helps that reduction on the liver, the stress on the liver. Liver extracts, mm, since 1896 been used by physicians. Uh, and others as well, particularly in Europe. The studies support that liver extracts, 
Okay, and we want them from clean sources, particularly we like New Zealand cows. Um, American sources oftentimes are vaccinated, they're full of chemical exposures, or worming agents, everything. We want clean sources of, of liver extract. Promotes liver cell regeneration, regeneration and scarring. Once again, studied since 1896. So I don't want to hear this bogus stuff about these things not being studied. Been around for a long time, a lot longer than drugs studied like Lipitor and that type of thing. Okay, in acetylcysteine, glutathione. The body will produce that in combination with adequate amounts of vitamin C, fatty acids, and other chemical reactions in the body. But you can take in acetylcysteine and glutathione if you know that you're going to have chemical exposure. If you're an auto mechanic or you're exposed to exhaust all day long, these are produced by the liver, but you can take them internally to help you deal with the environmental toxins that come into the body. Phenomenal. The glutathione comes in an under the tongue type of thing. I, I have one of my employees, her son, they spray near the schools when they're doing the strawberry fields, and her son will react. She gives him the sublingual glutathione, cuts his reaction time to nil, makes a substantial difference. So these are all available in, in good health food stores. All right, taken on an empty stomach as well. And the sublingual, sublingual means goes under the tongue and melts and goes directly into the bloodstream. Turmeric, an age-old spice. Indian, a lot of Indian studies on, on turmeric. Um, protects the liver from damage, bottom line, from chemicals, all those other things that we described. Ester C, remember I told you that vitamin C increases the glutathione production? Well, it's also required to convert cholesterol into bile. Okay, so let's scratch our heads here. If I can't convert cholesterol into bile, that means my cholesterol is going to go up. So guess what? So if you're vitamin C deficient, your cholesterol is going to go up. So, and I'm not talking about the 60 milligram RDI. That's bogus. We know the body under certain times can use up to 50,000 milligrams of vitamin C per day if it's sick or not feeling well. So, uh-uh. We need three to 4,000 milligrams of an esterified C or a mineral ascorbate vitamin C. Very necessary for people who have high cholesterol uh, to get it into the bile. Milk thistle, very, very important antioxidant herb. There's varying dosages. I prefer an extract called silymarin, which is a milk thistle extract. Lowers cholesterol content of the bile again. Strong glutathione, protects against chemical damage, increases production of new liver cells. Might have B and C customers that come in like the droves, adding these two things on there. And I gotta tell you, I have dozens of people who've done this little, little like program who no longer show up positive in their blood work because they did their own research. They listened. So, phenomenal. Used for hepatitis, cirrhosis, chemical drug damage, tons of studies to support. So if your doctor says no, he's wrong. Artichoke extract. Uh, there's certain types of acids in artichoke that protect and regenerate liver cells. They decongest the liver, lowering cholesterol. There's studies from the 1970s that talk about the lowering of cholesterol by artichoke extract. Dandelion, once again, two centuries worth of studies, pretty doggone good here, enhances bile flow. It literally helps a contraction of uh, the liver and the gallbladder to release the storage of bile, like I said, used for centuries by oriental medicine doctors and American Indian doctors. Alfalfa, alkaline in the blood, D3, if you don't have D3, poor bile flow interferes with deabsorption. Because remember I told you the liver was uh, responsible for some of those uh, storage of those fat soluble vitamins? Keeping the antioxidants high in the liver. All right. And then I really, really, really want to stress to you again that when you do a lot of these supplements, do the diet with it, okay? Real, real, real important. Diet, supplementation, whatever your issues are, handle it, take care of it, and do some additional research. We're going to be moving on to the next portion of our show, which is the fitness portion of our show. Thank you.
Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today, you know how we were talking about liver health and liver detoxification? Well, I've had a lot of sick people come in in the store with bronchitis, pneumonia, and everything else. And what I'd like to do is give you an exercise to do while you're sick. And now you're going to kind of like, whoa, I'm sick. What is this crazy woman doing? So what we're going to do is, if you can do good old-fashioned jumping jacks, 20 jumping jacks, three times a day, that would be wonderful. But if you can't, I'm just going to kind of show you how you can move a little bit to get your lymphatic system moving so that we can get you detoxed and things moving along. Because give your body, when your body's sick, it does detox. And you want to use that time to get things clear and get you well quicker and sooner. So first of all, I'd like to focus on the lower end and what you do if you can't do jumping jacks. Any kind of motion that you can do with your lower feet that involves jumping. So kicking out like this. You know, 20 times jumping like this, jumping jacks, whatever you can do as far as that motion is concerned, 20 times, what it's going to do is get your circulation going, it's getting your lymphatic system going. Now, we can't forget about the upper half of the lymphatic, which is our upper body. So, you know how you get sick sometimes, particularly with a respiratory infection, you will swell in this area, your glands will get hurt. So, anyway, what you try to do is you try to pump those out. And if you have a great massage therapist, got the money to spend, you can do lymphatic massages. But if you're sick and you're just trying to do it at the time, I just need you to raise your arms. And it's like you're pumping underneath here. That's probably the best way I can say it's like a pump. Most people probably don't lift their hands over their head hardly ever unless you exercise or go rock climbing. But what happens here is you're going to pump that lymphatic out. And if you can do that 20 times, three times a day, we'll get, well, and then do the jumping motion. We'll pump it. We'll get things moving a lot better and it'll free up some of those excretions. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. Let's back that up. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano with the latest news. Ralph? Thank you. We don't have much time, so I'm going to speed through this pretty fast, so please listen. All right. Olives. Olive skin. I'm not talking about the color of your skin. I'm talking about olives itself. Olives contain a component they discovered called maslinic acid. Why is this important? Well, with colon cancer. They found maslinic acid caused cancerous cells to basically off themselves, to commit cell suicide, so to say. They found that to be the next hottest thing when it comes to treating colon cancer. Plus, the doctors at the University of Granada and University of Barcelona also said it's one of the major things they look at when people control the propensity to cancer through their own diet, not through drugs. After that, since the United States is renowned for basically premature births, our infant mortality rates aren't the best here in this industrialized country. Magnesium sulfate. Why magnesium sulfate? Because when babies are born premature, they tend to be more susceptible to cerebral palsy. So the University of Adelaide of Australia discovered since the 1990s, when magnesium sulfate was administered to the pregnant mothers, the chance of cerebral palsy greatly declined. Also extremely important for those which have a genetic predisposition, if one exists. Main reason, they believe it protects the cell function and increases circulation. So yes, you can do something about cerebral palsy ahead of time. Real cheap, real simple, something that people that are concerned about should look into. After that, back to low carbohydrate diets. This kind of ties into the liver issue. What they discovered, and this was from the UT Southwestern Medical Center, and also published in the Journal of Hepatology. We talk about studying, studies, so to say. What they looked at is those people are on low calorie diets and low carbohydrates diets, but those on low carbohydrate diets actually reduced the amount of fat stored around the liver. Real people, real important for people with liver disease, especially. Just by reducing the amount of carbohydrates in the diet, it forced the liver to use fat for fuel, therefore reducing fatty acid liver substantially. In addition to that, just after two weeks, the low calorie diet group lost five pounds. The low carbohydrate diet people lost nine and a half 
pounds. According to Dr. Browning, one of the lead researchers, he said, quote, we saw a dramatic change in the where and how the liver was producing glucose depending on diet. Very good, very good study. Give a little bit of power to the people who basically need to control their own health. And after that, now we go down to more of like to beware and be careful. Ironically, when they look at children's medicines, they often will research the drugs, but rarely do they research the things they add to those drugs. Food coloring, dyes, emulsifiers, you name it. Well, basically, in the Archives of Disease in Childhood, a fetal and neonatal edition of the Archives of Disease in Childhood ailments, they basically released and said, hey, we have to look at these harmful chemicals or adding to the cough syrups and other medicines because they are finding out they are creating short and long-term toxic effects, an extreme concern. So that's something to look out for. When looking at medicines, try to make sure it's clean as possible. You don't recognize something in there. Don't take it for face value. Research it. Find out what it is. I didn't want to go into what red number 40 does. Then, back and tied to that, headline coming from the Department of Health and Human Services. The FDA, this is Human Health and Services, blasted, I should say, the FDA. The FDA failed to ensure that scientists conducting clinical trials and investigational products disclose their financial interest. Basically, they said up to 42% were missing any sort of financial disclosure whatsoever when they were there. Their concern from the Department of Health and Human Services was this. Financial relationships between researchers and medical companies were compromised in the safety of human subjects and the integrity of data. In fact, the Office of Inspector General discovered that out of 29,691 clinical investigations, only 1% listed its financial interests. Only 1% out of near 30,000. And why is that important? Well, remember estrogen? which being sold to just about everyone is the wonder drug, and almost every single doctor in the United States was prescribing it to everybody, Premarin, for example, other names like that. Well, they discovered that those people on that hormone therapy, once they reach past the age of 65, a certain part of the brain, the frontal lobe, actually shrank. How much so? Now I'm not talking the whole brain, just a small part. 2.37 cubic centimeters. How much is that? In the non-metric terms, the front of the brain almost shrunk a total of an inch in volume. In addition, the hippocampus, the hippocampus, a tenth of a cubic centimeter. And to finish it all off, those people taking antipsychotics for Alzheimer's, well, if you read one year of the study, they found out that people who took antipsychotics with Alzheimer's out-survived those who did not by 77%. But to finish it off, those who did take the antipsychotics, only 30% were alive. 60% of those who did not take them were alive. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you. Always very good. Very appreciated. Once again, thank you very much for joining our show. Research, research, research. Thank you very much.